this. It's a really short book, and so we're going to uh, do the whole book of Obadiah today. It is one, of course, cohesive message. Uh, the year was 1967 when Bert Jacobson was 13, and he went on a vacation with his dad and some cousins. They went off to California and just had a grand old time, and he was having such a good time. He wanted to send his mom a postcard, and his mom was incredibly shocked to get the postcard because it arrived in 2013. And uh, I wonder if you've ever felt like that when it comes to praying. I wonder if you've ever felt like you've sent some word out to the Lord and it's just lost out there in the mail somewhere. I wonder if you've ever felt that way with God's promises, that it seems like it takes forever for God to fulfill His promises to the point that you actually forget about it at some point. This is the way some of the early believers were when they had heard of this promise of Jesus returning and that right soon, and He didn't seem to be returning very soon. And this is why Peter wrote to them in 2 Peter chapter 3, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord, the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed when He comes. He will do so quickly. This is a lesson that the nation of Judah learned themselves. Because for, for years, the Lord had been saying through His prophets, if you don't repent, an invading army is going to come and carry you off. It got to the point where it was too late to repent, and that was going to happen, and they lived as though it were never going to take place. And of course we know that the Babylonians did come in 586 B.C. Well this is the message of Obadiah. The message of Obadiah is don't get too comfortable. Don't, don't forget that the Lord will have His way when He is ready to have His way. But it's interesting that Obadiah is not to the Jewish people. It is to the Edomites. It is addressed to the nation of Edom. And this is a lesson that they are going to learn. But let me tell you also that the lesson contained in Obadiah is a lesson that every nation under heaven will learn someday. I believe it has some real significance for us and some application, especially or specifically for those who are serving the Lord in ministry. Obadiah, verse 1. This is the vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord concerning Edom. We heard a report from the Lord and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us rise against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock in your lofty dwelling. You say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars from there, I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if plunderers came by night, how you have been destroyed. Would they not steal only enough for themselves? If great gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau has been pillaged, his treasure sought out. All your allies have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau? Your mighty men shall be destroyed, O Teman, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. Because of the evidence or because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever on the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother and the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast 
in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head, for as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow and shall be as though they had never been. But in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy, and the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau stubble. They shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor for the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Those of the Negev shall possess Mount Esau. Those of Shephelah shall possess the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of this host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath. The exiles of Jerusalem who are in Shepherod shall possess the cities of the Negev. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Now, really, the first question here that I think we need to address is who are these people? Who are the Edomites? Genesis chapter 25 introduces us to the very foundation of the Edomites. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the doctor, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together with her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. It's really important here. Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the other. And her days to give birth were complete. Behold, there were twins in her womb. First came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she was born. So Jacob, Jacob, we know, was later called Israel, and he is the father of the Israelites. That is one of the nations, but the other nation belongs to Esau, and Esau is the father of Israel of the Edomites. So the Edomites are by descendancy brothers of the Israelites. They are kinfolk, but they are two nations who have never gotten along. If you look at this map of an earlier time, you can see where Edom is just south of where Judah is. And you might remember from Numbers chapter 20 that when the Israelites were wandering in the desert, they asked to pass through the lands of Edom. They said, we just want to walk through. We don't want to take anything. If anybody does take anything, we'll pay you for it. We just want to walk through. And the Edomites said, absolutely not. They made them go around. I mean, there was this deep enmity and hatred between the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, and the Israelites, the descendants of Jacob, when it was time finally to go to the promised land, they had to go all the way around Edom because the Edomites would not let them pass through. Now, here's what's interesting. So eventually, fast forward to 586, the Babylonians come from the north. So if the Babylonians are coming from the north and you're going to run away, where are you going? You're going south. Who's south? The Edomites are south. So here's what the Edomites did. Edomites said, hey, brothers, come on, we'll protect you. It's okay, we're all kinfolk here, we'll take you in. And the Israelites said, oh, great. And they went, and the Edomites turned them over to the Babylonians. They completely sold them out. And this is why the book of Obadiah. This is why the message, because of this great betrayal and even profiting of the Edomites at the expense of the Israelites. 
but even more if you go back to verses 3 and 4. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling. You say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is among the stars. Let me give you a little picture of what Edom looks like. This might help us you get the right picture. Yeah, this might help us understand some of this language. Now, I want you to imagine that you are an explorer in the year 1812. You don't have satellite maps. You're just out exploring these lands, and you are traveling along, and you see this interesting cleft in the rock. You probably don't see the benches out there at this point. This is obviously not a picture taken in 1812. But you, being an explorer, say, hey, let's walk through that big crack in the rock. Now, this is where I'm disqualified. I'm claustrophobic. I'd say, you guys go ahead. But you walk through, and you start to see something absolutely stunning. through and you start seeing these facades chiseled into the rock and you realize eventually that you have stumbled upon the ancient and lost city of Petra. Petra where it means rock. Now these pictures, this is not what Petra would have looked like in the 6th century when the Babylonians destroyed Judah. And this is not what it would have looked like when Obadiah was speaking God's word. But it would have probably looked more like this. This is actually older Petra. This is what it would have looked like when Edom was there. So Petra, the ancient city of Petra, you can see it on the bottom of the map there where the star is, that the capital of this land was already being cut from the rock in the 6th century. By the way, the word for rock in Hebrew is Selah, and it's the word that is used in verse 3 when he says, you who live in the clefts of the rock, you who live in the clefts of Selah. Those of you who live there. So I want to share with you. I just wanted you to see what's going on with the language. We not only want to see what God is saying, but we want to see how God is saying it. So three lessons I think we can learn from Obadiah. Number one, pride is a dangerous thing. He says the pride of your heart has deceived you. Think about this. They were self-sufficient. Can you imagine trying to attack trying to attack a city that is literally cut out of the rock. It's up in the mountains. You have to get up in the mountains. By the way, 5,000 feet in elevation. Do y'all realize how thin the air is? How many of you have ever been to Denver and tried to go on a jog? Man, you know, I run. I ran about uh, three and a half miles this morning. I'd go to Denver today, and after a half a mile, I'd be stopping to take a break. The air is thin, so you got to go up in the mountains. This awful terrain, nobody's going to defeat the Edomites. They're as secure as anybody can be. Who would even dare attempt to attack them? We ever get like that? We ever think that we are absolutely secure? Maybe secure in our careers. If you're in ministry, don't be secure. <laughs> It's not a good thing, but you know, there's there's really not a job on the planet that's that secure. I used to be in the aviation business, and uh, there was a time back in the back in the 90s when the, the big thing that you just had to, you wanted to get hired by an airline because that's the only place where real job security was, and especially if you got hired by one of the majors like American or Delta, United or somebody like that, man, you knew you're just in it. And I had a friend got hired by Delta. And when he was hired by Delta, he showed up to school. They went to a meeting. They get him in an auditorium. And the very first words were, welcome to the last job you will ever have. He got laid off six months later when they had to make 
cutbacks. We don't want to get all that secure. I've seen people trusting the economy or their bank accounts. Some of you are too young to, to maybe remember the impact of what we call the tech bubble that burst when all these tech businesses, their stock was going through the roof. I have a relative who was part of a startup company, a tech company that, that actually, they started this company, 10 of them, and a year and a half later sold it for $1.3 billion. Seven of those guys were bankrupt within a year because they were bought with stock in a big tech company. And boy, that company's gonna be around forever Absolutely not. We can start feeling spiritually superior. Spiritually self-sufficient. Do you know that I taught at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, very large seminary for years, and it was common for me to encounter seminary students who didn't go to church on Sunday. Why go to church on Sunday? They're studying the Bible all week, right? I mean, they probably know more than their pastor, right? I mean, they're taking theology classes. They don't need church. It's called pride. According to the Francis Schaeffer Institute of Church Leadership Development, 72% of evangelical and reformed pastors, this is our, this is our camp, y'all, I want you to hear me. 72% of pastors in our camp say they only study the Bible when preparing for a sermon or Bible study. And I wonder how many of their sermons are telling people how they need to read the Bible. You know what that is? It's pride. Self-sufficiency. We, be, we become so sure of ourselves that we think we're above others, that we think we can't be derailed. We're in serious danger. According to data from the Schaefer Institute, combined with, they did a big study, the Schaefer Institute with Fuller Seminary and with uh, Barna, 50% of pastors' marriages will end in divorce. 40% of the pastors they surveyed have had an affair since entering the ministry. Let that sink in a second. They tell us that 1,500 pastors in America will leave the ministry every month. Now you're sitting there thinking that will never happen to me and if that's what you're thinking, you're on thin ice. When you start thinking that you're better than all you're in a dangerous, dangerous predicament. It's called pride. Who can defeat? Who can defeat a city carved out of the rock in the mountains? God can. And he did. Because pride is a dangerous thing. The second lesson here is how we treat others matters. Edom was mistreating the Jews, their own brothers. Verse 12, do not gloat over the day of your brother and the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Proverbs 24, 17 so says, do not rejoice when your enemy falls and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Oh, they loved it. They loved it. The Jews were finally given what they had come to them. They just loved it. We do too, don't we? Honestly, when there's a Christian leader that we have differences with, maybe it's somebody we would call a false teacher, and they fall, don't we feel a little bit of smug about that? I did. We're out there struggling in a little bitty church. I've been in that little bitty church with 25 people. And the big mega pastor gets fired like what happened this week in Chicago. Is there a little smugness? Is there a little gloating? Several years ago, the Boston Globe shined a spotlight on the Roman Catholic Church covering up sex abuse among its priests in the midst. Boy, we gloated a little bit, didn't we? It's those Catholics. It's because of the celibacy. It's because of their theology. It's because of their hierarchy. It's because of this and that. And then a few months ago, 
same kind of expose hit the independent fundamentalist Baptist churches. But we who aren't independent fundamentalist Baptists could still blow just a little bit and then my camp got hit this week, didn't we? Big expose on the Southern Baptist Convention. Well, we don't have the hierarchy. We don't have the celibacy. We don't have the theology. When we see someone fall, we should be grieved. Not happy. Not smug. Not prideful. If someone has brought about their own downfall, we should grieve over that. We should pray for repentance. And we should rejoice if repentance comes. We should never long for, we should never rejoice, we should never be puffed up when another human being faces ruin. Gloating is not very Christ-like. Neither is any kind of mistreatment. Verse 14 addresses this. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. They were capturing them and turning them over. We sometimes shoot our wounded. They fall and we kick them when they're down, don't we? We avoid them, we gossip about them, we exclude them, we punish them even after they repent. You know, Scripture gives us clear instruction about how to handle people who fall into sin, brothers and sisters who fall into sin. It's called church discipline. And what is the goal of church discipline? Is the ultimate goal of church discipline to humiliate, to punish? The ultimate goal of church discipline isn't it restoration? and redemption. When we enjoy the fall of others, it is time for a serious heart check. When the, when the church down the street has a scandal in the pastorate and the people start fleeing, we stand out there and scoop up those members. Oh yes, we don't do the things that that church does. We have integrity here and we scoop them up. But how many of us when that happens actually say to the people, hey, go back and stay with your church. We're praying for you guys. We, we don't want to profit off what they're doing. We want to encourage you to go and be a part of the solution. You hang in there and you keep the church afloat with your tithes and with your. This is the time to double down on your involvement in the church. When we enjoy the fall of others, it is time for a serious heart check. And finally, the third lesson here is that we have to remember that justice is coming. It's coming. Verse 15, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. Where are the Edomites today? Can you find them on a map? How many of you know an Edomite? Where are they? They fell to the Babylonians in 553. And then a little while later, the Nabataeans overran them. Justice came to Edom. It's coming to all nations. God will vindicate his name. And listen, he will vindicate his people. Amen. Look again at verses 19 through 21. Those of the Negev shall possess Mount Esau. Those of the Shephelah shall possess the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria. And Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of this host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Shepharad shall possess the cities of the Negev. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion and rule Mount Esau and the kingdom. Y'all, the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Nations rise, nations fall. There is only one kingdom that will only always endure. There is only one king who will always reign. Nations rise, nations fall, but the kingdom shall be the Lord's. We understand that Zion here is Jerusalem and is representative of the kingdom of God. Though all kingdoms fall, one will stand. Hebrews 12, 22 to 29. I want you to hear the past tense of this. This is writing to believers about where we are and where our location is. You have come to Mount Zion. 
and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth. Much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised yet once more. I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Listen. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Friends, this is the kingdom to which we belong. So take heart. We live in a world that is becoming increasingly hostile to you and me and everything we stand for. We are told today we're on the wrong side of history. Am I right? We are told today that our convictions are old and passe and need to be thrown in the ash heap of history. We are told that we are those who need to be marginalized in society. It's easy to get discouraged and it's easy to fight against flesh and blood. It's easy to demonize the people out there, but the doom of our real enemy is certain. Friends, we have a king who has given us the victory. Right now, Satan rages, and he gloats over the fallen, the fallen. But soon, and very soon, the king is coming, and he will be on a white horse. He will be wearing many crowns and a robe dipped in blood. He will be followed by all the armies of heaven, and the name written on his robe and on his thigh is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The beast and the kings of the earth will gather to wage war against him and he will destroy them to the uttermost. The sword that comes from his mouth will not leave even one of his enemies standing. Justice is coming. So brothers and sisters, stand firm. Stand firm, you citizens of Zion. Your king is coming, and he will reign forever and forever and forever. Hallelujah. 